Now that we've described the functionality of a finite state machine, we need to look at how we synthesize, <coughs> synthesize it. Now, synthesis is the step where you take a functional description and actually implement or come up with the final logic diagram. And the final logic diagram will be something that we can you know, build with parts. <coughs> so let's remind ourselves what we're doing here. So we have this example uh, finite state machine, which was this uh, push button window controller. And this needed to have a this needed to have knowledge about the past because we were going to either we're going to have a single input button which asserted a, an input signal called press, and it would either open or close the window. So the reason we needed a finite state machine was because we needed to know whether if we're in the whether to open and close the window, but it depends on where you're at. If you're, the window's open, you need to close the window when press is asserted. If the window's closed, you need to open the window when press is asserted. So what the re we had to know where we were at, and that's why we needed a finite state machine. So then what we did is we came up with the state diagram, and, which was a description, it was a design step, which basically came up with step, states that we were going to use and transitions to implement the functionality of that word description. And then ultimately we came up with the state transition table, which, which was just a tabular form of what the state diagram was. And so now we're ready to synthesize the finite state machine. So the first thing we want to do is think about what are the components of a finite state machine. Well, we need to store information about what the current state is. And we're going to do that by taking all of those codes or all of those states that were in our state transition table, and we're going to assign them some codes, okay, ones and zeros, okay? Well, and we're going to hold on to them, all right? Well, the only thing that we can hold is, or hold information with is a D flip-flop, or that's the one we want to use. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're going to have when we think about a finite state machine is we are going to have state memory, okay? So this block right here is called state memory. And that is, it's nothing more than D flip-flops that sit in here. So what we do is we, we, do, a little, uh, we do a little clock indicator there that says that the state memory is, is nothing, it's storage devices that are sensitive to the rising edge of the clock. But the output of the current, or the state memory, is a signal that's called current state. And you can think about current state being a code which represents the current state that we're in. <clears throat> now, this will be basically the Q outputs of all the D flip-flops, but it's, it represents the current state that we're in. And it will be updated every rising edge of clock. The input into the state memory is going to be the code that we want to update current state with. So we will call that next state. Okay, <clears throat> so this, this, you can think of that as the inputs to the D pins of all the D flip-flops. Now, however many D flip-flops you need depends on how you encode the states, but just in general at the block diagram level, this is what you have. You have state memory, which holds the current state code, and you will update it with whatever the next state code is every rising edge of the clock. So now we need something to produce the next state code, and that's going to be a block which is called next state logic. So we'll call this next state logic. And next state logic, what are the inputs to it? Well, it needs to know, to know where you want to go next, it certainly needs to look at any inputs into the system. Okay, so any inputs that your system has need to go into your next state logic. But it also needs to know where you're currently at. So this is the feedback characteristic of a finite state machine. So the current state needs to be fed back into the next state logic. Now, next state logic is combinational logic. It is nothing more than sum of products, product of sums. It is, there's no storage in here. State memory is a bunch of D flip-flops that hold the state codes. So we almost got everything, except our system doesn't have an output yet. So what we have, we also need to have on here is the output logic. So we're gonna have a block that's called the output logic, okay? And that's gonna produce the system outputs. Now, the output logic always looks at the current state, okay? And the reason is, is that if it didn't look at the current state, it wouldn't be a circuit associated with the finite state machine. It would just be a separate combinational logic circuit. But it, since it's part of the finite state machine, this is the output, this is the circuitry that produces the outputs based upon always the current state. And sometimes you can also look at the inputs, okay? So if I wanted to look at the inputs, the way that I would look is I would route that and I would bring it over to here and I would bring it in right there. 
Okay? It's important to note that output logic is also combinational logic. So these are combinational logic circuits right here, these two blocks, and this is, these are D-flip-flops. Now, there, is, there are two kind of general forms of a finite state machine, and they reflect their terms for them, and it represents whether the output logic looks at the inputs or not. So when it looks at the inputs, this is called a Mealy machine. Okay? So a Mealy machine, actually there's one L in there. There's a Mealy machine where is where the output logic depends on the inputs. But you don't have to have that. Like if, if you didn't have this line right there, the output logic can perfectly operate for some situations where it only looks at the current state. So it depends on the type of it depends on the functionality you're trying to develop. If you don't need to look at the inputs, you don't have to. You can just look at the current state. So if you don't look at the, the uh, inputs, that is the other type of machine, which is called a Moore machine. And Mealy and Moore are, are the names of people. So that's where they came from. So they're just, it's just describing how the output logic in these finite state machines is implemented. So these are the main blocks. And when we do the main blocks, it's important to always approach it with this three block approach because it is a very methodical synthesis project where we implement the state memory first, then we do the next state logic, then we do the output logic, put it all together and draw the logic or the uh, logic diagram. So now let's start with synthesizing the state memory. So here's what we need to do. We need to first assign the state codes. Okay. And the state codes, you say, well, what are state codes? Well, we have two states in our example. Okay, we have W open, and we have W closed. Okay? And we need to assign them digital values. Okay? And it's arbitrary how we do it. Okay? We could assign, for this one, it's pretty simple that you'd say, well, let's just, let's just say that closed is 0 and open is 1. But notice that that was arbitrary. I could have assigned closed to be equal to 1, I could have made open equal to 0. It didn't really matter. So it's arbitrary how you assign these state codes, and it turns out that there's different types of encoding approaches. So let's take a look at the three main types, and then we'll come back and we'll look at how we actually assign these codes for our example. The first type of coding, or state encoding, is called binary. And all you do in binary is you walk through your state names, your descriptive state names, and you assign a binary count. So for example, if I had S0, S1, S2, and S3, I would just come along and I'd say, well, let's go 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? Binary is a very compact way of assigning state codes because for n bits, you get 2 to the n, you can encode 2 to the n states, okay? So notice we had n is equal to 2. So ju with just two bits of a state code, I could encode up to four states. So it's a very compact way to do it. And if you had something where you, you wanted to solve for the, number of, for the number of bits you needed, so let's say down here we had like, I don't know, let's say we had uh, 41 states, right? So you had all these and you were like, well, how many bits do I need? Well, what you can do is you can just do a little uh, math on there where you'd say, okay, well, I have 2 to the n states, is equal, or 2 to the n is the number of states, and I want to solve I want to solve for n, so you could just plug in 41 is equal to 2 to the n, and then you solve for that, so you can use logarithms to bring that n down, so you'd have like n times log 2 equals log 41, and then you'd have n is equal to log <coughs> 41 over 2, and so n would be equal to, in this case, 5.36, so you'd round that up to 6. So you could take the number of states that you had and say, well, I need 6 bits to encode them in binary. So binary is just very simple. You just list your states and then you, you do a binary count next to them. Okay? Another way to do state encoding is what's called gray code. And gray code is, it's a compact code that is very similar to binary. So the number of states that you can encode is the same thing. It's, if you have n bits, you can encode 2 to the n states. But what you try to do in gray code is you try to never let more than one bit change at any given time. So notice when you went over in binary, you went 0, 0 to 0, 1. So one bit changed. Notice that that bit changed right there. But when you went from this state to this state, notice that the 1 went to a 0 and 0 went to a 1. You had two bits change. 
So this is sometimes bad for a couple of reasons. Number one, power in an integrated circuit is typically consumed when you transition, okay? Or the larger amount of power is tr is consumed when you transition. So if you're just sitting in a state, you don't consume as much power as if you transition state. When you think about transitioning here, <clears throat> I had to transition two bits as a, in going from here to here as opposed to here to here. So what happened is I consumed twice as much power. So if you could encode these such that they would only switch one bit at a time, you might be able to save power. Also, you can reduce the amount of noise because when you switch, you draw a lot of current, and the current moving around, moving through impedances and resistances and inductances, it can cause noise in the system. So gray code is an approach where we try to only let one bit change at any given time. So the way that it works is a two-bit gray code looks like this. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And you notice that only one bit changes here, and one bit changes here. We brought that one up. Then one bit changes here. And the idea is that as long as you move linearly around the gray code count, or you move back and forth, but it's always linear, only one bit will change at any given time. So that's the big assumption with gray codes is you can't have a state machine that's jumping all over the place or else the gray code makes no sense. <clears throat> but if you do have a very linear traversing state diagram, then a gray code might be effective. So if you wanted to scale gray code to be larger, what you, the algorithm to do that is step one, you have to memorize what the two-bit gray code is. So there it is. <clears throat> and then what you do is you write it again. You fill the most significant bit with zeros on the top and ones on the bottom. And then what you do is you mirror the two-bit gray code over the center axis. So in this situation, what I'd have is I mirror one zero to here, one zero, and then I take this and I bring it down, and it's one one. And I take this and I bring it down, and it's zero one. And I bring this down, and it's zero zero. So now if you look at that, only one bit ever changes as you walk through this, and that's the algorithm. So if you wanted to do it again, you would say, okay, I'm going to draw the axis down here. I'll fill zeros up here, ones down there, and I would flip it again. So that's gray code. And gray code is, you know, same thing. It takes, for n bits, you get two to the n states. The last uh, popular way to encode a state is with what we call one hot. Okay? Now, one hot, what you do is you use one bit to represent each state. So one bit is asserted for each and every state. So for example, for our example where we had S0, S1, S2, and S3, what we would do is we would actually need four bits in our state code. And the state codes would look like this. It would go 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, or 1, 0, 0, 0. So notice that if you had n states, you'd have n bits. So it's not as compact. It's not a compact way to encode the states. However, what you'll find is that sometimes this can lead to a lot of minimization of the logic when you go to do this next stage logic synthesis. So this can be, this can result in a very small amount of logic here. So if you had an abundance of D flip-flops, which are going to hold these guys, hold these actual state codes, then you might want to use one high. Okay, so when I do the state encoding, you do need to think about this. The reason I care how many bits I have in my code is because every one of these bits is going to be a D flip-flop in the state memory. So if I have two bits right here, I need two D flip-flops. Because Why do I need two? Because each D flip-flop only has one output it can hold with, Q. And you have two bits, you need two D flip-flops. Gray code, same thing. If I had these four states example, then I would have <coughs> I would have two D flip-flops. Over here, I'd have four D flip-flops, okay? One for each of the bits. So it it's, has a great impact on the size of the circuit because you're adding a D flip-flop every time you add a bit in your state code. Now, if you have a circuit that has an abundance of D flip-flops, maybe it's fine to do that. Maybe you want to go for speed, but if you're area constrained, sometimes it's better just to go for the, uh, the more compact codes. Okay, so we come back to our original, very simple example, and you say, what would this be if I encoded it in binary? Well, there's really only one way to do it. Let's just, do, let's just start and do a binary count. Zero, one, that's it. Okay. So that was, that was really the only, only way we could do it. Notice that we started with zero, though. That's really the only, uh, that's really the only thing to keep in mind with binary. And, you, and it, 
you'll see that as you synthesize these, count doing this binary encoding puts the state transition table into a form that's directly synthesizable using uh, combinational logic synthesis approaches. Okay, what if we did it in gray code? So let's say GC. It's the same thing. There's only one bit, so it'd be zero one. But let's look at one hot. One hot would actually be different. So I had two states. I would go zero one and one zero. So we, it's arbitrary. You can pick any code that you want when you do the state memory uh, synthesis. The first thing is we're doing the state codes. We're assigning the state codes, and then we choose the state codes. And for our example. I mean, let's just choose this. It's the simplest thing, so that's what we're going to encode our states. We did our state encoding, and we're done. Okay? So now we're sitting there, and everything's great. So the next step of this is to implement the D flip flops. Okay? Now, when I say implement the D flip flops, it's kind of easy because you just know, well, in this situation, I only have one D flip flop. But the, the thing about it is, it's how many are you going to lay down. So if you, if you did one hot, you need two D flip flops. Okay. Well, we just need one D flip flop, so we're going to implement that by just taking a D flip flop, D and Q. But then we need to put the state variable names. So the state variable names. And the reason that the state variable names are important is because we need to, if we're going to have a D flip flop and we're going to have inputs and outputs, we need to name them accordingly. Okay. So what we're going to do is I need to name the inputs and outputs of my D flip flop. So let me put this D flip flop again, and here's D and here's Q. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this naming convention. It's a little small, but let's look at the naming convention. We know that the output is the current state. So what we're going to call that is I'm going to call it Q underscore cur. So Q representing the output, cur representing current state. Then what I'm going to do on the input is I'm going to call it Q underscore next. And you might say, why didn't you do D next? Well, it's because it's not really the next D value, it's the next Q value. So Q reminds me when I label these nets that it is a D flip-flop. It is the output of a D flip-flop, which is called Q. Next and current remind me where these things go. Okay, so this is great. We have, the, we have our state memory basically synthesized. And at this point, I want to go back and I want to update my state transition table to include all the values that I've just come up with. So if you recall, this was the state transition table we had. And as you do example after example, you'll learn where to leave space in here. But let's just redraw this and we'll now put in our codes and our state variable names. So I'm going to come along and I'm going to have a column which is current state. And I'm going to put down just like we did before, I'm going to put, I'm actually going to do this to make it a little bit more readable. So I'm going to have current state and I'm going to put W closed and W closed. And then I've got W open. And I've got W open. And now what I'm going to do is this current state actually also is going to have the code associated with it. So in this situation, I'm going to have Q underscore current, which is my state variable name for how I encoded these. And if you recall, we encoded closed as a 0 and open as a 1. So now I have this additional information in here. So you needed to leave room like right here in the table. Now we also have our inputs, which, I'm gonna, which is just one input, but it's called press. Okay? And you, you'll see why. I'm doing this column right here to be like the net names in my signal. And then these are kind of the description of what they are. So press can either take on a 0 and a 1 or a 0 and a 1. And then we're going to do the next state. So we say next state. And that is going to be where am I going. So if I'm in closed and I don't get a press, I stay in closed. If I'm in closed and I get a press, I go to open. And then when I'm in open and I get no press, I stay in open. And when I'm in open and I get a press, I go to closed. Okay, so now here's our next thing that we needed to add in here, is I'm going to put the code for the next state. So now my next state variable name, if I'm going to have actual values, I'm going to say Q next. 
and that that was very important because I just can't have ones and zeros in the circuit. I need to label everything that can take on a one and a zero because it's an actual signal in the circuit. So now Q next is where am I going? So what is the code for W closed? Well, that was zero. What was the code for W open? Well, it was one. What about W open was one, W closed was a zero. So now this is what I have for my next state logic. And now finally, we just put our outputs in there again. So we'll go ahead and do the outputs. And notice that I'm leaving room in here now. And we'll call it we'll like this. So we're going to have, and I'm just doing it in red to match everything before. So I have open CW and I have closed CCW. Okay. And then that's the end of our table. So we'll kind of close that up. And basically what we have now is 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. <clears throat> so now this is now our new state transition table. And notice that it's very, it's complete. I mean, it really has everything that we need in here. And you, when you did your original state transition table, you'll learn to leave room for this column and this column. So these are the columns that you really need to do. So your state variables and your actual values. Okay? Okay, so that's the state memory. And now what we need to do is we need to do the next synthesis, which is going to be the next state logic. So I need to now go in and I need to build the circuitry that's going to produce the next state code. And you say, well, okay, well, that's, that's good. What is next state logic again? Well, next state logic is going to be the combination logic circuit, which looks at the inputs in the current state and produces the next state code. It's combinational logic. So let's keep that in mind. Think about what we can do here. What, which of these am I synthesizing? I'm building a circuit to produce what? Well, these current state and the input are the inputs into the combinational logic circuit. So I'm not synthesizing a circuit to produce these. These are my inputs. The current state and my input are the inputs. But I am building a circuit for this right here, Q next, Q underscore next. This is the next state code that I need to create based upon these two. So really all I do is I can look at that and I look at the inputs and I synthesize the logic for it. So I need to synthesize the logic for Q next. And you can do this a couple different ways. You could say, well, let's put it in a kernel map. Okay? You usually go into a kernel map for bigger circuits. So let's do this. My inputs are Q cur and press. And I go 0, 1, 0, 1. And I go 0, 1, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, 0. You know what was very important here? I needed to keep track of what the input codes were. So I had 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Notice they were in a nice binary count. Okay, that was not by accident. If you methodically create the state transition table, you can almost always get these in a very methodic or a, a binary count. And that's exactly how we defined true tables, the formal true table. So I went 0, 1, 0, 1. And I said, well, this is fantastic. I, can, I got no circles on here, so this is great. So I could say that Q next is equal to Q cur not handed with press board with Q cur handed with press not. Or I could have also recognized that this checkerboard pattern, this is simply Q cur exclusive board with press. So these are two equivalent uh, implementations. But you know what? That is the next state logic synthesis. So I have the logic expressions for those, and I'm ready to do the fine. So when I go to do the logic diagram, all I need to do is know where to put those. So let's now do the last one. So the last step of the synthesis is going to be output logic. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up here just so I have a little bit more room. So I'm going to do output logic. And what I'm going to do is synthesize the output logic. And what is the output logic again? Well, the output logic is, if I look at my original block diagram, it is going to be the combinational logic circuit which produces the outputs. In our example, this little push button window controller, the outputs are called open CW and closed CCW. And we look at we look at the current state and we also look at the inputs. So let's build that circuit. Okay? Well, where are, where's the information I'm trying to synthesize? This is key. Remember, when you do a logic expression, it only produces a scalar output. That means I have two output variables that I need to produce, but this is a circuit, 
and that's a circuit. So I need to synthesize the logic for open CW in addition to closed CCW. So let's do the first one, okay? Uh, open CW. I mean, you can put it in a, in a carnal map. This is kind of, it is a little silly to do this, but, but I, I do this and I look at that and I say, what are, what are the inputs? This is the output I want. 0, 1, 0, 0. What are the inputs? The inputs are right here. The inputs are the current state and the input, press. So I do a K map that's just like what I had down here, Q, cur, and press, and I just pop 0, 1, 0, 1, and I can just pop these directly in, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And I circle that up, and I realize this is completely silly to do a K map. I'm just kind of going through the process, because you usually use a K map when you do this by hand, because the circuits are bigger, but it don't matter. Open CW is equal to, it's going to be Q, cur, not, ended with press. Then we finally said, well, I need a circuit for closed CCW. So I'm going to do close, close or close, close, whatever, C CW. And I'll put a line right there. And what I'm going to do here is I need to synthesize this as 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so I'm going to do a K map. We don't need to do a K map, do we? <laughs> we go Q, Gr, and press. It don't matter. It don't matter. 0, 1, 0, 1. I go 0, 0, 0, 1. You can see right away that that is nothing more than Q, Gr handed with press. I have now synthesized all of my logic expressions and my state memory, and I am actually ready to draw the state diagram. Not the state diagram, the logic diagram. So I'm ready to go here, and how do I do this? Here's all the information I have, and let's start drawing it. So I'm going to come along, and I'm going to draw, I'm going to start drawing the logic diagram, and I'm going to do it starting with state memory. And I'll try to, I'll try to unveil this now, so there's the logic I'm trying to do, and here is the state memory, okay? So here's, here's what I have here, okay? So what I'm going to do is I first put down my state memory. It's nothing more than a D flip-flop, but I needed to label Q next, and I needed to label Q cur. Those are my state variable names. Notice the clock's in there. What is my next state logic? It is the combination of logic circuit that drives Q next. And look at what it is. I went ahead and drew it as the sum of products, so I didn't use the exclusive OR gate. So I actually synthesized this circuit right there. But it's producing Q next, which goes into the D input of the D flip-flop. That's the circuit that dictates what the next code is going to be that's updated on Q cur. OK, notice it looked at press, and it also looked at the current state. And then finally, let's do the, the logic for the output, so the output logic. And this is two separate circuits. Okay, the output logic is two separate circuits. So when I look at it, I had one situation where open CW was Q cur not and with press, and press came from over here on the input. And then my closed CW was simply an and with Q cur and press. And this now is my logic diagram. So th this will implement the functionality that I had designed. And if I look back at my original kind of the way that I originally described a finite state machine, here was my original uh, block diagram. State memory is nothing more than a D flip-flop which holds the current state codes. It's updated with the next code, the next state code, every rising edge of a clock. The next state logic is a combination logic circuit or circuits that produce the next state code based on the current state, that back, and inputs if necessary. And the output logic is another combination of logic circuit, which produces the outputs based on, it, for sure, the current state and sometimes the inputs. Whether it looks at the inputs, it did in this situation, so we call this a melee type machine. If the logic had just worked out where it didn't look at the input, we would have called it a more type machine. But that is the entire process of designing a finite state machine from start to finish.